Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hello, everyone. So for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Michelle Cavanaugh. Um, I um, work for D.A.R.E. I usually run these with Aida, who's our other D.A.R.E. coach. Um, She's not here today. I am going to be answering as many of these pre-submitted questions as possible. Um, Some of them are all pretty similar, so I will try and group them together. Um, After this call, if you have to, um, if you have to leave early, if you missed some of it or something resonated with you and you want to hear it again, it will be uploaded on the app, usually within 24 hours. Um, And, uh, and it's usually stays on the app until the next one comes up. Eventually, they are kind of broken up and po- posted up on podcasts and on up on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on a podcast and if you hear me describing something visual, um, you can see the video version of this on YouTube. All right, guys, here we go. Okay, question number one, which I thought was interesting because I'm going to answer it differently. Um there's two sentences here. And if it was just one sentence, I would have answered it. But because of the second sentence, I'm going to answer it differently. So question number one, hi team, could you please recommend any books for people dealing with anxiety and depression? Parentheses, questioning the meaning of life and things in life. So plenty of books out there on anxiety and depression. I personally recommend there. Um, there could be, I, I mean, I have a whole list of books here that I've read. However, okay, however, that second part of this question makes me stop for a second and say, questioning the meaning of life and things in life. So if you are looking for a book to find the answer to the meaning of life and things in life, and you're dealing with anxiety, there's a good chance you are just going to be stuck buying and spending a lot of time listening to a lot of information, trying to find some sort of certainty, trying to get the answer to alleviate your anxiety, which is why I will not be recommending anything else for you to read. Because if you are questioning life and you want to find books that have the answers to life, good luck, because they're just going to have ideas about things and what other people think about the meaning of life. This is generally what keeps people stuck in the cycle. And again, I say this on a lot of calls. We have a weird sort of business model here at DARE, and we walk a fine line between putting out a bunch of content and having webinars and, 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 and telling people, definitely listen to all of our podcasts and follow our social media But also what we post on there is to tell people to spend as little time involved in anxiety as possible. It's like it's an over-involvement problem. It's a, if you see my posts on Instagram, I call it, it's a doing disorder. So finding more books to make you have more answers to the meaning of life is just going to keep you reading more books, needing to know for sure. And really it's it's because I just need to know because I feel unsettled. I feel anxious. I feel uneasy. And if I could just know, I feel a relief. And I'm telling you, if it worked, I would tell you to do it. It just doesn't work that way. It's learning how to kind of full on just feel uncertain and feel bothered that you don't know. It's okay to still feel bothered and still feel unsettled. More books are not going to fix that feeling. So I would tell you, put the books down and go all in on life. And the answers to most of those, what's the meaning of life? Honestly, the answers are, the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't need to know. And I don't need to spend any more time involved in trying to find the answer in order to live life. Go live life. Instead of spending your time not living life, trying to figure out the meaning of life. Seems a little, seems a little backwards when you think about it like that, right? All right. Anybody else have that as a similar sort of thing that they get stuck in? Got to find that one more book. Watch that. She hear that guy. Oh, that guy. He's pretty good. Oh, what about that woman? Oh, that group. Oh, let's try this. Let's add this in until suddenly you're spending your whole day reading and scrolling and 
flagging and posting on forums and it's all about anxiety. That's not our goal here. Our goal is more of a short-term relationship. You know, like use the app eventually in the future for overall wellness, because I like to do certain meditations at certain times of the day. But once we understand that sort of less is more, okay, um, it's it's going to be like less involvement in trying to find the right answer intellectually and more sending this message of safety, which was really my post today on Instagram. Like I should pull it up and, and show you guys here. Um, it was on my Instagram page, and it kind of looks like this, okay? And what I posted there, and I'm probably going to reference it a lot on this call, okay? And I wrote a whole bunch of other stuff about it, but the gist of it is, our, remember, our alarm center is the part of us that is concerned about danger, okay? Not how we feel. What happens is we mix up feelings equals danger. And so I don't like how I feel and I fight feeling. And that's how your alarm gets a little confused. Now it starts thinking that all forms of discomfort are danger. Okay. So the messages to be sent are this place is safe. Like this situation I'm in right now is safe right now. My body is safe. My feelings, how I feel is safe. My thoughts are safe. It's safe to imagine. My imagination is safe. I can sit here and imagine anything. I am in no or no more or less danger if I imagine something unpleasant than if I imagine something pleasant. This one's hard. It's safe to remember. Okay. It's also, I am safe here while I can remember things back there. All of which, what happens is when, when we start treating situations, thoughts, memories, imagination, what ifs, as danger, then we find more of it. And that's what gets us stuck in the loop and the cycle of desperately trying to get rid of whatever it is we're trying to get rid of. So I'm probably going to reference this a lot today because it kind of comes down to, uh, it, it all boils down to, why can't I feel this feeling? Why does that feeling need to be gone? Why are you dealing with X, Y, and Z? Why do you keep looking to see, did I do it right? Is it gone? Because then you're still treated. It's it's safe to have this feeling. If it wasn't safe to have something present, okay? If something actually was danger, I would tell you, keep a careful eye on it. Keep looking to see if it's gone. You can go back to life when it's gone. You should really stop life when it's here and attend to this. That's how you treat bears and bees and murderers and volcanoes. That's not how you treat. This feels weird. That doesn't look real. I feel X, Y, and Z in my body. There's a thought I don't like. When we stop life and we treat those things as danger, we keep finding them. And now we're having our, here comes a whoosh of fear to help us fight the things that we're fighting. All right. So we move along. Okay. Why, why do panic attacks make you feel like you're going crazy? My fear is one day I'm going to just finally go off the deep end and be insane from panic. Who's with her? Because we usually go one of two directions, hands up, or type in in the chat because it's usually, oh my God, I feel like I'm going to go crazy. And then my other, oh my God, I think I'm going to die, right? So we have, um, I'm going to physically die. That's usually linked to health, anxiety, physical sensations. Here's the heart palpita palpitations, but here, and then here's the feels like I'm about to go crazy. We're usually so focused on thoughts, feeling disconnected, brain fog, detachment, DPDR, right? And so your body, a panic attack does all of those things. It does the physical things and then it does the, the mental things, right? So you have this whoosh of energy that magnifies everything. Some of us hook into our body and some of us hook into our mind and then we attach it to a worst case scenario, right? And that's just how a panic attack feels. It feels shit. Remember, bare bones of what it is. This guy, right? Favorite guy loves you so much because he wants to alert you every time he senses danger. And if a panic attack felt good, right? If your alarm felt good when you were about to, to walk towards a bear or walk off a cliff, we would all go walk off cliffs, right? 
humans want to live that long. We rather be like, oh, oh, that that thing's about to eat me. Oh, it feels so good. Pain feels great. Fear feels great. And we get eaten by everything. And then we don't we don't create more generations of people because we're all eaten by things. Okay. It is designed to feel awful and uncomfortable and to stop you on your tracks. Oh my gosh, stop. Right? Alert. Right? Your your alert on your car, your alert in your house isn't coming. And it doesn't eventually sound better. And it doesn't make a different sound when it's just burnt cookies or a little bit of fire. An alert is an alert and will always sound and feel the same. It will jolt you. It is a like, almost like a reflex. You don't get to decide if you have one or not. You don't get to decide your startle response, right? Somebody comes up behind you and you're scared and you jump. That's how it feels. A panic attack is a rush of adrenaline at the wrong time. Okay, because nobody's calling me for a panic attack when they're on fire. Because nobody gives a shit about how you feel when you're on fire. You care about being on fire. And the feeling is in the back and is useful and productive because it's heightening your state while you stay locked onto the identified danger. What happens when we get stuck in the cycle of panic attack, we get locked into the response, the fight or flight response. And as somebody just posted in the in the chat, waiting for three hours for the heart attack to come and then wrote ridiculous. So that's what we're doing. Because there's no context, here comes the, the whoosh without a place to plug the whoosh into. So now we're left with a whoosh and a cord. And we're like, the hell did I put this thing? I gotta plug this in somewhere. And so we're like, mm, let's try and not die plug it into try and not die or mm, let's try and not go crazy. Plug it into try and not go crazy. And then sometimes we just plug it back into itself. We stare and we fight. We, we get scared of being scared and we just fight the fact that we're scared. And I'm going to keep fighting until I'm not scared anymore. Remember though, that's not the language this guy speaks. This guy keeps sending you scared until you're not fighting anymore. But you decide I'm not fighting anymore. I'm going to keep fighting until I'm not scared. Then I'll stop fighting. And all he hears is, she's still fighting. So let's keep sending her energy to keep fighting. Whatever it is you're fighting. So if you're fighting derealization, if you're trying to deal with feeling disconnected, this, whatever this is, let's say this is derealization or dizzy or thought or whatever, as long as you're treating it as something that must be gone or attended to or it's back or what if it lasts forever, if you're treating it as a threat, this guy will continue to keep showing you and sending you energy to keep fighting the thing until you start treating it as safe. We get like, you'll hear me on the post, tell a boring story rather than I feel like my soul is coming untethered and detached from my body as I as I hurl into the world of psychosis. It's I feel weird right now. I'm not minimizing the feeling. I'm just trying to get us to tell a more boring, just the facts story of what's happening. What's happening right now? That looks weird. That looks weird. Whoosh. And I feel scared when that looks weird. My body sent me scared to help me fight through this looks weird because I fight this looks weird. So it's my job to show this guy that this looks weird is safe. So I get better at having things look weird. I treat it as safe and not with a disclaimer, not with an expectation attached to it, with a period. That's it. That looks weird. Mm -hmm. Period. And then keep living while things look weird without checking to see if it looks less weird. Does this resonate with anybody? I just picked derealization because somebody just wrote that in the post. But derealization or dizzy or heart palpitations is not the problem. It's kind of like the catalyst for what starts the problematic behavior. So we're all kind of doing the same thing but we're just doing it about different things. Okay. It, it, most of this takes more of a, it's more of a habit cycle, like OCD picture OCD and 
it's like derealization becomes the O. Okay. My, how I feel becomes the, O, and my constant involvement and fighting and judgment and pushing and reading and podcasting and all the things I'm doing and checking to see, did it work? Is it gone? Cause I don't like this thing. This thing bothers me. I need to get rid of this thing and I need to get rid of bothered. This, the C is your problematic behavior. The O can always change to something else. So someday it's dizzy and then it switches to heart palpitations and then it's thoughts. And then like, yes, O is the subject of your fight. O is the subject of your problematic behavior. So if you're doing dare to deal with this squiggly thing and you're checking this to see if it worked, you're not using dare with the right intention. Dare is to teach you how to leave shit alone. How to, how to notice the thing that's present. And go, uh huh. Mm, mm, yeah, that's what's there. Like, just like this, like a dick, like, like how I am, right? Like, mm, yeah, yeah, that's there. And if my fight doesn't change the presence of what's here, if it stays present, regardless of how I fight, this is the problematic part, not this. This is the uncomfortable part. This is the problematic behavior that marks this thing as danger. Okay. All right, guys. Good. Let's keep going. So you're going to hear, I'm going to keep that cycle, that template in mind. Okay. And as I go through these questions, be easy to, it's a little easier to see Oh, but she didn't talk about whatever sleep. She didn't talk about feeling groggy. She she didn't talk about brain fog. It's it doesn't. That's just a different one of these. That's just a pink squiggly instead of a black squiggly. But it's still we're all kind of doing this. Okay. Okay. Next up. Actually, this is the perfect example of what I was just describing. That awful, groggy, head pressure feeling, including the dizziness and lightheadedness, where as soon as you get up in the morning, how to, hear the word again, how to deal with that. I can't drive my kids to school because of it. Do you, do you see the similar patterns where go from feels like I'm going to go crazy right? Here's another feeling, right? Mind you, just to back up, feels like I'm going to go crazy isn't a feeling, okay? You're taking a feeling and then you are making a prediction based on that feeling. So even just to break it down into two separate parts, I feel blank. And now you start telling a story based on that feeling. And that's when I'm not very good at just feeling feelings. I take feelings and I treat them as not acceptable as signs of danger to come, as opposed to what do you actually feel? If, if you, if it's not feels like I'm about to go crazy, what, what do you actually feel? Like just sit and feel the feeling where do I, this is the somatic type stuff. Where do I feel it? What is the feeling? Even if I can't put a, a name to it, like scared or sad, like maybe if it just feels like a bunch of different things, it's not identifiable, right? Just look at it, give it a form, give it a shape. Is it moving? And just because feelings are observable, they are noticeable. So once you've noticed and observed the thing that's present, it's what we do afterwards that creates the disordered response. We have a disordered relationship with feelings because the feelings are there. Feelings are human nature. You're going to feel, we, we have the, the ability to feel all sorts of feelings. It's what happens after that feeling shows up and it's noticeable. We involve ourselves in some version of, oh my God, I love that. Okay. This, this is what we're helping you release with dare, not this. Okay. However, weirdly enough, you do start to feel better. You do start feeling more connected. You you no longer, you feel much less dizzy, but it is never, ever a goal. Again, weird, but that's how it works. It's never a goal. It's a byproduct. It's something that happens, not something that you strive for. So that awful, groggy, head pressure feeling is this, right? Now, there are things 
to, oh, well, did you try, did you check to see if you have low iron for this, for that, to make this bigger or smaller? Did you check to see, maybe it's your iron, maybe it's your sleep. Did you get a sleep study done? Did you try, try, try? Like, so if you hear people offering suggestions, did you try, did you try for this? Oh, you're nauseous. Did you try ginger? Did you try lemon? Did you try? That's great for fluctuating levels of discomfort. But when it comes to a disordered relationship with that particular fluctuating level of discomfort, that's why it always comes back to this, because this marks the marks this as danger. And then as long as this is gone, then I'm safe. And so, and if you're always going at it that way, it'll be, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else. That didn't work. Let's try something else. This thing is still here. Let's spend more money. Let's spend more time. Let's take more classes. Let's, let's take more supplements, more of this. Did you try this? Did you try this? And again, if you're just, if, some other sensations showed up that you don't have a disordered relationship with. You just kind of not don't like it. Like, oh yeah, I have a headache. I have headaches a lot. Oh, did you try doing this? Oh no, I didn't. And you kind of go at it with a lighter approach, like a, oh, it'd be nice. Let's see if this worked. And you notice alleviation of discomfort. That's great. Go for it. But what my calls with these calls Generally, when we develop an anxiety disorder, we have treated the presence of a particular discomfort as a threat to us, as danger, and we become overly involved in it. And it, as long as it's still here, there's still something wrong with me. Who is Whose line is that? Every time there's a particular sensation, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Oh my gosh, what's wrong? Or it's a sign that there's still something wrong. Rather than, oh, yeah, I noticed that feels uncomfortable. Oh, yeah, my throat feels tight. But with us, it's generally, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Oh my gosh, what's wrong? It's a sign of something wrong. And then we attend to this. And as long as we feel good, okay, then I'm safe. When I feel uncomfortable again, I have to get rid of this so I can go back to being safe. And so that awful groggy head pressure feeling, as soon as you get up in the morning, okay, why are you feeling that way? Well, you just woke up. It might be the adjustment to light. It might be higher cortisol levels in the morning. It might be you've developed a habit of waking up and checking for that. I would wake up and check for nausea, right? You would get two seconds of bliss when you kind of forget what life is. And then you're like, oh my gosh, where's that feeling? It's so habitual. We almost wake up and go looking for the thing we don't want to find. And then we find it. And we're like, oh, shit, there it is. And then we go, oh, it's back. Another day of this. And we go into survival mode, surviving through this thing. Okay, if you keep surviving through this thing, this guy will keep clearly showing you this thing because you're treating the presence of this thing as danger and the absence of this thing as safe. And our job here is to get you better at feeling bad. So whether it's present or absent or not, if it's present, you just feel bad. You don't have to go into doing mode and treat it as danger. Sometimes, does that make sense, guys? I'm kind of talking a lot right here, but somebody else talked to, so it's just me. Does this make sense? That's why this is going to take the form of anything. So if, if, if the subject is always about a black squiggly, our, our responses are always going to be very similar because it has nothing to do with the black squiggly. It has to do with our doing about the black squiggly. Okay. All right. And here, okay, let's keep going here. I am at a point where I am sad of what's happening to me, anxiety, et cetera. It's like I'm scared to feel joy and happy again. I'm going to kind of break that down in half. Okay. I am at a point where I'm sad of what's happening to me, anxiety, et cetera. And, and it's like, we, and then we kind of get stuck staring at sad, staring at anxiety until anxiety, sad becomes the new thing. 
I stay involved in and I talk about and I wait for it to be gone. And if I can only be happy, it, it, it takes a very similar form. And then we spend all day, wake up, check to see how I feel. Oh no, it's there. Get through another day. Try and do a bunch of things to see if it works. Oh, it didn't work because I still feel. And if you're chasing a feeling, right? That's happiness trap book. I'm looking there because that's where my books are. Um, ever, ever trying, trying to find a feeling is just kind of fighting the feeling that's present. Okay. So you might just be, where are we here? Sad of what's happened to me, anxiety. Notice your story about how you're feeling as well. Because if it's, oh, yeah, I feel anxious right now. Oh, what's here? Oh, I don't know. I haven't looked here. Let's check and see what's here. Oh, yeah, that, that's what's here. Mm-hmm. Yep, this is what I found. This is the feeling that's here. Mm-hmm. And you kind of come back looking here and you keep living life. And you might notice throughout the day how you feel and it's noticeable and you allow it to be there and you keep going. But if you get into like a habit of telling a story about what's here, right? I'm, I'm sad about what's happening to me. There's generally probably some version of, oh God, why, why me? Why can't I just get out of this? Why can't I just go back to my old self when I used to be happy all the time? bullshit by the way we kind of like cherry pick that memory of like i was always fine and never had anxiety i always slept great no you probably were better at not sleeping well you probably like had like you weren't so locked into the importance of being happy all the time and now when it's a goal we can't find it right so if you're telling a a never-ending story a forever story oh what i uh, it's going to ruin my job. And what if it never goes away? And we stay involved. If if I hold this up to the camera, okay, if I zoom in on this, this is all you see. Just because this is all you see doesn't mean this is all that's here. Okay. 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 Granted, there's not much going on behind me either. But let's say I actually had something behind me other than this weird void of a wall. Okay. It's still here, but if you're zoomed in and staring at this thing, you've you've filled your entire field of vision with the thing you're trying to not see. And it's it's well intended, but this is working, it works against us because again, we're staring at this thing, trying really hard to accept and allow. No, you're trying to get rid of it. Because accept and allow means, oh, that thing that's here. Mm. And sorry, again, for anybody who's new, if you haven't figured it out, kind of got a potty mouth, it's, oh, that's what's here? I don't know, fuck it. And that's what's here. I don't have to stare at what's here because I find it unpleasant. I can notice the present of what's here and just kind of get back into doing and looking at what I'd be doing, whether this thing is here or not. And strangely enough, when you treat something as unimportant, truly, and it doesn't happen from doing, it happens from being with the thing that's here. Your brain has this way of filtering it back into this area of unimportance. And when I do like one-to-one call or if I'm on groups, I'll do some like exercise of like, like anybody who's listening to this right now or looking at this, you've been probably looking at me. Now, look beyond the screen that you're looking on. What's on the other side of this phone or the or the the laptop you're looking at? Do you see the couch on the other side of you? Do you see even the icons on the screen? You probably didn't notice them the whole time, even though they're right there in front of your face, just like I am, right? Whatever's on your screen is still on your screen, but you you ha- our brains have a way of tunnel visioning you and helping you clearly see whatever it is you're directing your focus and attention to, because by you directing your focus and attention to something, you send the message to your mind that, well, this is, this is what I'm treating as important. So your body's going to help you tune into what's most important and tune out of everything else. That's why it's never really about, sometimes you can have the most uncomfortable thing, but you become tuned out of it. Like if there's construction work going on, even if it's loud outside and you're quietly reading a book, 
like you can just not hear that noise after a while, but only if you're, but not if you're not trying, not if you're trying to not hear it. Right. Yes. Like I just wrote like my mom with the grandfather clock, go back and listen to that old webinar. Like the more you try and not hear something or get annoyed that you hear it again, the more importance you place on it. Okay. This guy follows your lead. So what you're treating as important, he will keep helping you see it most clearly. And so that's why actions and behaviors must change first, not the feel. The feel changes later. All right. Oh, see, the other part of that question is I'm scared to feel, it's like I'm scared to feel joy and happy again. And that that's come up this week, actually, on some of my calls as well. Um, hope, hope is kind of scary. You know, it's, it's a little scary to start to feel better because then it's like, wow, this feels good. I, I don't want to get my hopes up because I, I, I can't even handle it being gone. Right. It's almost like we get, we get good. We get used to feeling so awful that unless if there's no guarantee that when I start to feel better, then I feel better. And then it's stripped from me. It's taken away from me. And then here comes, oh, it's never going to go away. I feel worse. Um, right. So sometimes hope can be a scary sort of thing. Don't let that get in the way of your progress. Because again, then we're always treating like present fluctuating feelings as stuff to cling to because then we start to feel good. And again, I'm not just saying how to treat anxiety, how to treat how you feel all the feelings, pink, blue, purple, whichever ones show up, right? You you don't get to hang on to some and push some away. It's kind of like, they're like holograms, right? So you're trying to cling to one it's still going to come and go on their own. And you're trying to make one not go. You, you like act like you're protecting yourself from a feeling, but the feeling's still there. So learning how to just sort of, here comes a feeling. I notice this feeling that's here. I can notice my opinion about it. I can notice I find it pleasant. I find it unpleasant. I like this one. I don't like this one. Again, I'm telling a boring story right now, but just trying to keep it simple. Here's the feeling that's here. I do not know how long it will last for. I don't. The good, I mean, the pleasant ones, the unpleasant ones, joy. Oh, I feel joyful right now. Feelings only happen now. They're only here. So you can't cling to them because you can't take them with you. Okay. If they're happening two days from now, it's still your now. It's not, you know, we, we don't feel future feelings. We feel here and we have thoughts here. Okay, so feelings are fluctuating sort of states that we enter, usually, usually based on what you're involved in. Sometimes there's not much context to them, but sometimes there is. So if you're constantly imagining worst case scenarios, it would make sense that you would be feeling more in a heightened state, both of which are safe. It's the trying to not have those thoughts so I cannot have anxiety, trying to get rid of anxiety by trying to replace my, my negative thoughts with positive thoughts. That's where we get stuck when we become at odds with ourselves. And we're here to help you make peace with yourself, not feel peaceful, feel peace and calm and joy, but make peace, which means no more war. Stop, stop the battle. Okay, let's keep going. How do you practice DARE when anxiety is constant 24-7? It can be a very taxing process that requires focus, and I find it difficult to do it all day. And yes, that's true. And this is a question, a version of this question comes in on every webinar, and that's usually comes from a good old doer, which is most of us, somebody who's using DARE as a thing to do rather than to not do. And this is where it's, these are the things that are hard to turn into posts because it's so non-tangible, but using dare all day long. Remember, dare is not a weapon to get rid of anything. Dare is to teach you how to be more in like a, a being mode with whatever it is that shows up. And it requires non-effort, 
not a lot of effort. I have to remember the steps and do the A and then do I always do the R? Or what if I just do the E and I don't like the A, but, but what's D again? And what's the same distraction? And we get so stuck in trying to do it just right. Don't get out of this with your head. Okay. You're not going to prefrontal cortex your way out of this. This is not a, like we think the thinking and the doing and the involvement kind of keep us locked into it. What unlocks us is here. You have dare is more of an attitude, which is why you hear me say, fuck it a lot. Here's this thing that's here. Dare is teaching you how to take on a fuck it attitude of like, and now not fuck it that I care about like to the, to the thought or to the feeling it's, it's to be pinned to what action needs to be taken next. And I'm like, oh man, it's raining outside. That doesn't mean I like it. It doesn't mean I like the rain. It doesn't mean like, oh, I was supposed to go outside and now I can't go outside. It means no further involvement is needed here. None of my precious energy and my precious time will ever be useful to eliminating the thing that's present. And honestly, my involvement kind of keeps it there, right? Like my videos you've seen of me poking the water, trying to poke away the ripples in the water. Not only is this not helpful, <laughs> it keeps, it, it, it delays the process. Your involvement delays the process. You trying to settle down water only gets in the way of the water settling itself. Okay. And so the problem an anxiety disorder is you never had to get involved behind the curtains to begin with. Something was loud behind the curtains. It caught your attention. And then we became involved. That's where the problem started. Not the thing that dropped behind the curtains, right? Then we became involved back here. And now we find all the stuff that's going on behind the curtains. Oh my God, what's going on back there? It's so loud back there. Oh, as long as everything quiets down, shh, everything quiet down behind the curtains and never make a noise again. Then I'll go back to life. Who's trying to go at it that direction? It's not working because you're just going to find more noise behind the curtains because behind the scenes is noisy and it's busy. And it's truly just like somebody um, posted on the YouTube channel. I forgot I said it. It's like you don't have to work really hard on healing when you were never broken to begin with. And it's trying really hard to get better. That is actually the, the disorder, the problem. So it's, I'm going to, instead of every fluctuating discomfort, I feel my story about it is what's wrong with me. I still have a problem. It's still here. It's not gone. It's, oh, that was weird. And treat yourself as inherently safe rather than as inherently damaged or broken or still needs fixing. Hey, there, there's nothing, there was nothing wrong to begin with. You're not broken. You're just kind of stuck right? Kind of like the button gets stuck. And like, we end up staying stuck by staring at the button waiting for it to be unstuck. Like we get unstuck from this disordered relationship with anxiety by plugging ourselves back into life, not to distract yourself from thoughts or feelings or sensations, but just take them with you. Take them along with you. Do what you would be doing if you were feeling pleasant sensations. Do what you would be doing if you were having thoughts you, you found like, you know, you liked rather than thoughts I don't like. It's it's an over-involvement problem and a resistance problem. Okay. And that means we don't keep maintaining and staring at the thing until it's gone. It's, I can take my eyes off of something that's safe. Would never tell you take your eyes off of something that's danger. Okay. But if something is safe, and you start treating it as safe, that means you start letting it be present. That's the simplest version of dare that I could think of. Okay. If it's safe, you treat it, it's okay for its presence to be there. It's, it's okay that it's present because it's safe. Okay. And this is a very similar um, to the one of the questions before, why do I wake up every morning with brain frog? Anxiety sets in immediately. It takes me all morning and sometimes all day to relax a little. And then I feel like my mind is now losing it. Okay. You see what we do? Wake up in the morning. 
I notice what's present. Okay. Brain fog, or I'm still waking up. I'm still going from being asleep to being awake. I'm feeling tired. Okay. Here's brain fog. And now I'm, I'm noticing it because, oh, here it is again. And my story about brain fog is one of danger. I feel like my mind is now losing it. So now we wake up, we notice a present discomfort, and we hook it to a worst case scenario. And it takes almost all day for it to go away. I'm assuming you're looking all day to see, is it gone yet? Is it gone yet? And then I'm only okay if it's gone. Because when it's here, I hang on because I feel like I'm losing it. This is a sign of crazy. Who who does this with other things? Who takes a present discomfort and pins it to a worst case scenario? Heart palpitations equals feels like I'm about to have a heart attack. Okay. I feel nauseous and I feel like I'm about to throw up are two different things. I feel nauseous is a noticing a present sensation. Okay. Feels like I'm about to throw up is taking a present sensation and predicting the future with it. Okay. It's your imagination of your, of your, of a predicted future. I'm here to get you back to, I feel nauseous right now. Because you have a body and there's a good chance it's going to be nauseous at some time again for the rest of your life at some point. And you're going to be dizzy and you're going to feel disconnected and you're going to have doubt and you're going to have uncertainty and you're going to feel weird and you're going to like all present forms of fluctuating discomfort are going to happen. But if we think better not be nauseous. So now I know I'm not going to throw up. See, that's then I'm I'm only okay if these present sensations are gone because now I know a bad thing's not going to happen. And we're kind of spending a lot of time bullshitting ourselves into stories that everything's going to be awful. Everything's going to be okay as long as I feel or don't feel. And we're using as feelings as like, like truths of determined destiny. It's not. It's the truth is how I feel right now is how I feel right now. Yeah, I feel nauseous. You don't feel like you're about to go crazy. You feel probably scared. Your thoughts are racing. I noticed I feel a little disconnected. I noticed that building looks weird, like it's moving around. Mm -hmm. And then I want to hear the story you tell about that present experience. Because it's if you're telling a danger story, then that present experience gets marked as danger. Okay. And so here's Two questions actually from the same person, but I'm going to say them because they it, it explains why this person is submitting the questions. Okay, that didn't come out right. Bear with me. I can't seem to recover after six months. Please help me. My mind is racing with negative thoughts and I'm trying to do, listen guys, listen to the words. I'm trying to do so two O's and so, so many positive things and talk positive to myself, but it's just not working. And the next question from the same person is how to get rid of negative thoughts desperately. Who can hear it now? That's not just my ears. Who else hears it? And and type in the chats. What do you hear? What's, what's the, not the, what is the person treating as the problem? And what is the actual problem blow up the chat what what do you guys do you hear even if it's that's you or if you're doing it with something else sometimes it's easier to hear it when it's somebody else's submitted question right um try, this person sounds like they are trying really hard and this is most of the members of dare we are not lacking in effort we are not lacking in willingness to do freaking anything to get rid of this. I will tap my face. I will meditate the shit out of this. I will take all the negative thoughts and I will replace them with all positive thoughts. And I will do whatever you tell me to do, Michelle, who I don't really know from a hole in the wall. I don't know you, but you tell me what to do and I will do it as long as I can get rid of this. And it's 
that is actually the problem. You are treating thoughts that you don't like as danger. And you trying to get rid of thoughts is the problem, not the thoughts. So uh, there's a thought I don't like. Replace it. Put a better one in. Oh, there's another thought I don't like. Replace it. Put a better one in. No, just have shitty thoughts. It's your involvement with shitty thoughts, the meaning you attach to them. You, what if I never stop noticing that I'm noticing my thoughts, right? We get into all this meta land because our eyeballs are turned inward and then we stay inward. Okay. And we just stay there. And we, somebody wrote guilt over negative thoughts. Guilt comes with this, this idea that it's my responsibility. Why did you think about punching that kitten? You shouldn't be thinking that thought. That's a bad thought. That's what's wrong with you that you like, how could you have such a thought like that? How awful that again, this, the, Oh yeah. Oh, my, my brain just conjured up a thought. Ah, I did. Look at that one. I just noticed that that thought that popped up into my head. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I just imagine me punching that little kitten. Mm -hmm. Period. Okay. What comes after that? The guilt is usually about, and I did something wrong because of what happened. Now I failed in some way, or there's something morally wrong with me that I could ever have such a thought. So here comes guilt as if I did something wrong. And then we turn it into shame because not only did I do something wrong, that means I'm a bad person and now I'm a bad person. And I can only be a good person if I eliminate all unpleasant thoughts. Good luck, my friend, because you don't get to eliminate thoughts you don't like. All you succeed in doing it's creating an anxiety disorder, right? Because here's this, here's this neutral, non-dangerous thing. You can think about punching kittens all day long. You are still safe and the kitten's still safe unless you punch a kitten, but that's an action. That's not a thought, okay? You, you thinking about whatever you want to think about doesn't put you in any more or less danger. You might notice that certain thoughts compared, right? Thought pairing, compared with, oh, when I think about that, oh, that makes me feel so good. Or I crack up laughing at that funny thought. But when I have thoughts that I find unpleasant, oh, that comes paired with a feeling of disgust or bothered or fear or dread. Sometimes you even get that feels like I lose my balance feeling. Who gets that? Like if you have a thought, like almost like lose your balance, like sometimes those existential thoughts will do that to me. Like, it's on the other side of the other side of the universe. But that's a thing. But what's on the other side of that? And you almost lose your balance. And again, they compared with the feelings we find unpleasant. And then we get into a battle with both of those things because we find them unpleasant. And the battle is what marks them as danger. Do you see guys, I'm saying so many similar words and all of the, all of the questions so far have all been pretty different, but it's all the same response. Now, if somebody sent in a message saying, I am currently on fire right now. I am absolutely in danger. I am being tossed into a volcano and I'm surrounded by bees. What do I do? I would tell you to not do any of this shit. I would say, Oh my God, stare at the bees, fight the bees, get rid of them, stay in fight mode, engage in fight, fighting, fleeing, freezing, or protecting behaviors to protect yourself from the danger until you're safe. Absolutely hang on for dear life to stay safe, but you don't need to stay safe in feelings. You be with feelings. You be with your thoughts. There, it, there's no survival needed. You don't survive through discomfort. You survive through danger. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, I would like, so I'm going to answer this question a little differently than how it was submitted. I have been listening to you guys for a while now. You've helped me in many ways. I can't even describe. Thank you. Thank you. I would really like to hear more information on anxiety and how it affects memory. 
My anxiety has attached itself to what if I'm dissociating from reality or what if I'm losing my memory, especially when I do simple everyday things like not remembering checking the mail or stopping at a stoplight and not remembering it. Thank you. Okay. So in the, in there, lost in there, I see with my eyes, my dare eyes is reassurance because I can, I could have easily pulled up some research studies that show, I could pull up some that show how anxiety negatively affects memory. And I can probably find a research study that shows how, how it does not affect memory and how it, but brain scans, research citations will not help with reassurance. Okay. What you're asking, because the rest of that question is you questioning every time you sort of like space out and go into autopilot mode, which is what we do a lot of the day, which has nothing to do with an anxiety disorder. This has to do with human nature right? You're treating that as if I'm creating some sort of permanent damage in my body. Oh my God, now I have a memory problem. Hey, can you guys talk about how anxiety affects memory? Because if it, if it does affect memory negatively, I need to work really hard at getting rid of this anxiety. Okay. And I better really pay attention to me not forgetting things. More effort, more fight, more struggle, more resistance. Can you guys hear it? Can you hear it in the words? Can you hear it in the, in the question? So what happens is you, here's the question. It's that's now the identified problem. Oh my God. I just realized I forgot something. I was so busy being anxious. I don't even remember walking from the, from the car to my house. Did I flush the bowl? Did I, did I, did I put deodorant on this morning? I don't even remember doing it. I pack my lunch and I don't even remember putting that drink in the lunch bag. Now, not in a heightened state. It would be eh, when you're in a heightened state. Again, what's the line? Oh my God, what's wrong with me? That's a sign of entering psychosis. This is a sign of permanent brain damage. I am becoming forget. Now I'm creating anxiety induced dementia and I am going to, now I need to pay attention to everything I do to make sure I haven't created brain damage for myself. All right. Everybody who's on chat, who's doing all of this stuff? Cause this is a very common thing too. And, and here comes exhaustion, exhaustion. This is, it's so freaking tiring to do this because you don't have to, you don't, you're not supposed to. Do you know how many times I picked up my hand during this call? Who counted? Well, maybe it's important. I should count. And so now if every time I pick up my hand, it's me signaling somebody to get murdered, you're going to notice it because now I've told an important story attached to it. You're telling an important story attached to something that your body just does. Now, spacing out when I'm on the train or I'm driving somewhere is now a sign of danger, a sign of a threat. And again, dare, the way we approach this is getting better at at spacing out, right? This stuff happens all the time, right? You're driving home, especially it's it's habits. It's something you do habitually. If you're driving home from work and you take the same route all day long and you're just spacing out and then you pay attention to where you are and you're like, my, what, what did I pass the exit? Who does this? I mean, who's become aware of being aware of where you are after you've been unaware of where you were. Right. And then we get startled because you're like, well, Did I drive? And then here comes doubt. Oh my gosh. But there were like 10 red lights. I'm here. There's 10 red lights behind me. Did I stop at all of them? What, what if I didn't stop? What if I went right through them? What else could I have done while I was unaware? I could have done some dangerous things. Do you guys, you see what we do? We're, we're treating normal human things as everything's danger because I don't like it. Everything's danger because it scared me. And I'm telling a dangerous story about it when I'm just trying to get you back to spacing out and leaving spacing out alone because you space out, you space out before, but you didn't treat it as danger. 
Okay. So when you sort of like kind of didn't realize like you did something and you did it before, like you see something was done. You're like, oh, I didn't even realize I did this. Oh, the sunset. Oh, I didn't even realize that. I don't even remember walking to the. Then we start questioning and doubting. And the doubts are usually some negatively biased story of, again, this means something's wrong with me. So I'm hoping some of these questions, even if they're your not particular questions, does everybody see how they're relatable? Because it's never, everybody's sending in questions about their black squiggly messes, their black squigglies. But this has nothing to do with the black squigglies. This has to do with me treating, becoming involved and treating the black squigglies that must be gone or else. Must sleep or else. Must come down or else. Must get rid of nausea or else. Must be connected or else. Must, and so when it's this must or else, then this must be gone. So we're going to go down the rabbit hole of final elimination. Okay. The goal is on importance and irrelevance, not elimination. Let me see if we can squeeze in. And I just want to finish up with this. This is um, this is a good question here. Um, I have been diagnosed with Cushing disease, okay, and I'm currently being treated medically. Treatment is slow, but usually has great outcomes. The high cortisol levels, which is associated with Cushing's disease, um, has given me anxiety. Do you, do you have experience with helping Cushing's patients overcome their anxiety? I'm looking for encouragement, how to overcome my sensations associated to my thoughts and worries. Thank you. This is a good question because there might be something physiological going on with your body that's hitting your adrenaline release valve, right? Without you even doing anything about it whoosh, here's adrenaline, whoosh, here's adrenaline, here's some cortisol, right? It comes with the territory of Cushing's disease, okay? And so that's why having present anxiety or fluctuating levels of anxiety and an anxiety disorder are two different things. They're related because you usually don't have an anxiety disorder without anxiety, but it's the disordered relationship with fluctuating levels of anxiety that's the problematic part, okay? So you have something physiological going on with your body that is creating more anxiety at the wrong time, okay? I'm just trying to simplify this with kind of simple words. How do I treat that? It com- And again, anxiety comes with, it's, it's, dis- it's uncomfortable. I don't like the feeling and it's getting better at having the feeling just like if something else came with achy muscles or tiredness okay it's oh yeah i have this thing these are symptoms of the thing this is when anxiety is the symptom of something else a symptom means it's it's might be here because of something else so fluctuating levels of feeling are here because of this particular thing this is not disordered, right? This is here because of this. The disorder is, okay, I'm looking for encouragement as had to overcoming my sensations associated to my thoughts and worries. So if now I'm having fluctuating levels of anxiety and my interpretation of it is, oh my gosh, now it's never going to go away because now I have a medical condition and now I have to deal with this forever. How's dare supposed to work for that? How am I, how am I supposed to live like this? What am I supposed to do if I can't get rid? Do you see how this happened? So there are people with Cushing disease that don't have an anxiety disorder, but they may have fluctuating levels of anxiety. This one can get a little tricky and I sound like I'm splitting hair sometimes when I answer these particular questions. Does this make sense to everybody where I can have fluctuating le- like things happening in my body that may come from a, from a medical, there might be an actual medical reason. We tend to go the opposite way. We're constantly treating anxiety as a symptom of something and looking to see what could possibly be wrong with me so I can turn off that valve so I can turn off like the flow of anxiety. If I could just figure out what's wrong with me, I can get rid of anxiety. 
It doesn't really work that way. But if it's, wow, this particular diagnosis comes paired with these particular physical sensations that go on with my body, one of which may be more levels of anxiety. And there is how I heal my relationship with the fact that my body may enter into more states of anxiety than maybe other people. With or without this particular disease, it could be true as well, right? I am sure, I don't have any electrode research to prove this. I am sure I experience more love fluctuating levels of anxiety than my husband. I am sure I do. It's just my particular body. Okay. I got into a disordered relationship with those fluctuating levels of anxiety when I tried to put the kibosh on it, when I tried to not have it, not feel it and, and like live my life around that feeling. Some of us sneeze three times in a row. Some of us rarely sneeze at all. Some of us eat like you have one bit of spice in your food and it bothers your stomach for three days. And some people have like a cast iron stomach. We're all kind of basically built the same, but all the nuances and all the fluctuations, like we're not identical. So some of us have different parts of our body that fluctuate differently than others. It's a good chance some of us just have a little more of a a quick trigger for our anxiety to ring. And whereas that's great for survival purposes, we tend to be great survivors, right? We can't because we're good at doing people who don't have a, a quick fire, a quick, like a quick startle response are more likely to get eaten by the bear, right? You're like, Oh, that thing. I don't know. I kind of heard something, but nah, I don't know. guess what? You just got eaten by a bear because you might be good at living, but we are good at surviving. We kind of just get stuck treating our survival response as the danger. And that's where we keep the loop going. So guys, sorry if, uh, you know, you were hoping for Aida. She should be on the next call. Um, you guys were stuck with me today. Um, so my ask if I offer one-to-one sessions, I do. Um, you can go on the DARE website. Um, myself and Aida, we offer um, one-to-one calls. I promise you, we are not going to tell you anything different. We don't want you to give us your money so I can talk to you more about this. Take in all the free content and information first. And and some people do like a one-to-one call because it's just nice to have a customized approach for D.A.R.E. and how this all works. So yeah, you can go on the D.A.R.E. website and um, you can go through, um, I think, um, materials or programs and you can click on one-to-one coaching and it's right there. All right, everyone. Take care. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.